Oh, hello. You're still here? This has been a long program. It's one thing that it's a good program, but it's been a long program. If it was not good, you wouldn't be here, I know. And I was worried. I thought, we're going to bleed people. They're going to start making their way for the exits. Lock those doors. I, uh, I am so blessed to be here. You know, I never even heard of the Quad Cities until recently. That's how big America is. That, doesn't that crack you up sometimes? That you think there are parts of this country that you get there and you think, I didn't know about this place. Now, I've heard of Iowa. I've been to Iowa. But uh, it's just a blessing for me to be here, to be invited here. And I, I, I ask the Lord to use me. I, whenever, <clears throat> before I speak, I pray with my wife just that the Lord would anoint what I'm saying so it's not just me, but that it's the Lord speaking. And that I'm not speaking to a room or to a crowd, but the Lord has something for you. And by you, I literally mean you. The Lord wants to speak to you and to say something to you. Did you know that God speaks today? If you didn't know that, <clears throat> I don't have time to explain, but let me just say you're wrong. God speaks. God is alive. He's not a set of principles or a set of morals. or He is alive. He loves you. Uh, and it is his desire to come into your heart and to make you the person he created you to be. He cannot do that without your permission. You have to open your heart and say, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, come into my heart and use me for what you put me on the planet for. Because I don't know about you folks, but life is hard. Life is hard. Being married is hard, even if you're in a good marriage. Marriage is tough. Having kids is tough. Paying bills is tough. But if the Lord is with you, it's different. He walks with you, and he leads you and guides you and helps you. And I want to say that up front, because there's nothing more important than that, that you open your heart and you say, Jesus, speak to me, guide me. That is the only piece of advice you could give to somebody that is just... There's nothing else to say. That is why you were created, to have a relationship with the one who created you and loves you, died for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. Um, I, I want to tell you a little bit about my story um, just briefly and then uh, talk about some important things. Uh, <clears throat> my story, uh, in a nutshell, is uh, my mom and dad, who I talk to most days. My dad's 96, my mom's 89. My dad came from Greece in the 50s. My mom came from Germany in the 50s. They met in an English class in New York City. And, uh, you know, being raised Greek and German is kind of weird. I don't know how to, how, to, how to explain it to you. But, you know, my parents, of course, still have accents. And, uh, and, and if, but if you raise Greek and German, I think you understand what that means. It means you will be raised Greek. Yeah. So, you know, we went to the Greek Orthodox Church and stuff. And because my parents came from a part of the world where, from parts of the world where they didn't have what we have in America, you know, freedom, liberty, all this stuff that most Americans pretty much take for granted until maybe recently, um, they made me understand this is not normal what we have here. This is a sick gift that you don't deserve and you better appreciate it. Because most people in the, around the world would do anything to come to this amazing country. You can't blame people for wanting to come here. You can't blame people for wanting to come to this country. You can blame administration for not having a border policy. Uh, and if you don't blame an administration for not having a border policy, you're probably okay with sex trafficking, in which case I have nothing else to say to you. Um, so... There's nothing wrong with mixing politics and faith, okay? People always say that. That's nonsense. If you believe in Jesus, you know slavery is wrong. If slavery is on the ballot, you don't say, well, we don't want to take a position on that. I just want to bless everybody. No, if you don't take a position on that, you're a bum. You don't understand the Bible. If you don't take a position on the things that matter to God's heart because somebody tells you, oh, you're being political, that's nonsense, folks. And we have been gaslit by secular and in many cases demonic forces telling you don't be political. I'm not gonna make an idol of politics because guess what? I'm not gonna make an idol of anything. Any good thing, you can make an idol out of it. You know, my, my friend, Chuck Colson, the late Chuck Colson, 
used to say, you know, uh, Jesus is not going to arrive when he returns on Air Force One, right? We're not looking for a political savior, but to ignore politics is to be a fool. To ignore politics is not to understand the insane blessing of freedom and self-government where you are obliged as a citizen to be involved. And if you're not involved, you let evil forces take over and mess your children up and mess your culture up. So you need to be involved. That's God's blessing that you are allowed to be involved. Most countries in the world, they're not interested in you being involved. They got it covered. They'll tell you what to do. In this country, we've had the blessing of freedom and self-government. And, you know, most of us haven't, you don't get that in schools anymore. So that's very, very important. So my parents raised me without even trying to understand that, oh, yeah, communism is evil. You know, mo most kids I grew up with in, in, in public school, I went to public school, we were in a working class community, work, my parents were working class immigrants from, from Greece and Germany, as I mentioned. And, you know, we, uh, we understood, you know, the value of hard work, uh, the, the value of liberty, but in a way, the kids that I grew up with didn't understand it the way I understood it because my parents tasted communism. My mother grew up in Germany, which was Nazi Germany, which became East Germany under the Stalinists. She knew communism and the satanic wickedness of communism, of states, a state controlling people. It's slavery. It's evil. My father grew up in Greece where the communists tried to take over Greece. So I understood this in a way that a lot of my wonderful classmates, you know, growing up, they, they kind of thought, well, we're just in America. Everything's great. You need to taste evil sometimes to say, like, oh, that is evil. I, you need to know it's real. And I think a lot of times Americans, we've been so blessed, we forget there's such a thing as evil. And we kind of think, how bad could things get? Well, we're getting a taste of it now, aren't we? Just a taste. Which brings me to Romans 8.28. Some of you know the famous scripture. I'm not famous for quoting scriptures, but there's a few. Romans 8.28. All things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. If you do not love the Lord and are not called according to his purposes in your life, all things do not work together for good for you. Bad things happen and bad things can get worse. But if you give your life to Jesus and say, Lord, whatever happens in my life, I want to use it for you, even the bad stuff, the scripture promises, God promises, all things work together for good. For those that, that love the Lord, that are called according to his purposes. Now, why do I bring that up? Because let's look at what, what happened in the, in, the, in the last few years. If you didn't have evil corruption in the world of journalism, Carrie Lake said journalism is dead. A lot of us have been waking up in the last few years. A lot of stuff that we thought was okay, you realize it's not okay. We used to be able to roughly trust journalism. Now you know that would be unwise. That would be foolish. Because a lot of the stuff that we trusted, we now know it's not what we thought it was. There is evil. There are people who don't understand their job or what they're supposed to do, what God would require of them. But because all these bad things have happened, for example, because Carrie Lake understood journalism's not good, this is not good. This doesn't feel right. Because of that bad thing, Carrie Lake woke up. And she's doing some amazing stuff now. Because of the bad stuff that happened. There are lots of people in this country that because of what's been happening the last three years or so, have been waking up. And I want you to know that that is happening. And that is an illustration of Romans 8.28. You start realizing things. You start seeing things. And the Lord has in his mercy allowed these things. Election fraud. You never thought you'd see that in America. You never thought that would even be possible. Well, even if you're not convinced it's true, you know something's going on. You know, even if you haven't looked into it, you say, this doesn't look good. This doesn't look like America. And, and let me tell you, once most Americans don't trust the system... America's gone. So effectively, America today is gone. If you don't know that your vote counts, then you just say, well, why should I vote? 
the Lord has brought us to this crisis to wake up his people, to wake up the church. And those people who do not yet know Jesus, he's using this time to shake them and to say, okay, now you see this evil? What do you think the answer to that is? I, the Lord your God, am the only answer to that. So there are tons of people talking about God who weren't talking about God a few years ago. Did you hear Tucker Carlson talking about everybody needs to pray a few, few minutes each day? He wasn't saying that a few years ago. There's all kinds of people. Even Mike Lindell. <laughs> I love him. He's a friend. God has used horrible things to wake him up. And so I am cautiously optimistic. But there's a couple of things I want to communicate. First of all, I want to communicate that what we have in America which really is the greatest country in the world, and we don't deserve this country. We are blessed to be able to be here. We are blessed with the honor and the privilege to be allowed to participate in our government. We don't deserve it, but God has given it to us as a gift. So I want to explain how there is no way you can have liberty and self-government on the American model without faith and virtue. I want to mention that. I also want to talk a little bit about this big book that I wrote, this Bonhoeffer book. It may be a big book, but people have come up to me over the last 13 years over and over and over and over and said, I'm not a reader, but I read that whole book. And I'll tell you why. Because the story of that man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is one of the most amazing stories you'll ever read. And I just wanted to write it so that you could understand it. Because once you understand what he did and what, what his life was, it changes everything. So first, let me just mention the idea about America and faith and virtue. Now, I stole this idea from Oz Guinness. Some of you know Oz Guinness. He is a brilliant writer. He's a friend. And he wrote a book called The Free People's Suicide. And there's an idea in that book. When I read it, I just lost my mind. I said, how have I lived this long? And I didn't know this. Now, what I didn't tell you was I grew up in a working class home of immigrants. And by the grace of God, I ended up at an Ivy League university. I went to Yale University, right? Now, what I didn't know when I went there in the 80s was that all of those places have already been given over to an anti-God, anti-American agenda. So a lot of times people think like, oh, you went to Yale. That's one of the darkest places spiritually, politically, you could ever send your child to. And I drank that Kool-Aid. And I got confused, and I drifted away from God, from love of country. I was so confused. But the Lord, in his mercy, around my 25th birthday, visited me in a dream. Now, I'm not making that up. I'm not lying. It was a miracle. Remember I said God speaks? God actually speaks. And he speaks to everybody differently, right? You can, like, speak to your kids differently, depending on their personalities, whatever. God knew that to get through my hard head that had been screwed up by Yale, he needed to do something very dramatic. And so if you go to my website, it's just my name. In fact, I want to encourage you to just go to my website, ericmetaxas.com. It's written on your program so you can spell it. But if you go to ericmetaxas.com, it's a video where I tell the story because it was a totally miraculous conversion. And if you don't believe in miracles, when one happens to you, you get a problem. God spoke to me miraculously in a way. It was like game over. I am no longer able not to believe in Jesus because he has spoken to me. And, and, you know, he's proved himself to me over and over through the decades. But that happened to me. Um, and I really went on, uh, you know, once, once you accept Jesus, you're not done, right? And a lot of times people focus so much on evangelism. It's like, that's all that matters. You accept Jesus? Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes there's a little more to it. If you accept Jesus, now you haven't crossed the finish line. You crossed the starting line. So when I accepted Jesus on my 25th birthday, now I get to learn what does that mean? And not just what the Bible says, because people get so focused on the Bible, they forget there's a whole world beyond the Bible. And the world beyond the Bible is uh, created by the God who created the Bible. And the Lord wants us to take our faith into every sphere. Your, your, your study of the scripture is meant to help you bring God's values into every sphere. 
the media, journalism, politics, every single sphere, right? So that was the process that I was on. But a few years ago, it's got maybe it's 10 years ago or less, I read Oz Guinness's book, A Free People's Suicide, where he talks about Lincoln and the founders and stuff, and he, he explains this idea, and this is where I just lost my mind. I said, how is it possible that I had a good grade school education, good public school at that time in the 70s, I went to one of the finest universities in the world, except that you, you already know what I think of that. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna tell you this stuff there, okay? Here's the idea. Oz Guinness calls it the golden triangle of freedom, and when you get this, it just, you understand. So I'll say it quickly and I'll explain it. The golden triangle of freedom, he says, freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith. Faith, in turn, requires freedom. What does that mean? Freedom, which sometimes we throw these terms around. What does freedom mean? What does that mean? It's not license. When we say liberty, it doesn't mean I can do whatever I want. What is freedom? Freedom means I'm not going to be governed by someone else. I'm not going to have a tyrant or someone enslave me and tell me what to do and what to think. I'm free. But when you're free, you have to govern yourself, right? So how did the founders think that for the first time in the history of the world, now this is in my book, If You Can Keep It, if you want to know where I write about this. But in my book, If You Can Keep It, I explain this, but I'm telling you, I got it from Oz Guinness, so I dedicated the book to him because I don't want him to sue me. Uh, he's a friend, I don't think he would sue me. But I got so excited by this, I said, I got, I got to write about it. I want to tell the world about this. Um, freedom, self-government, the founders, all of the founders, not just a couple of Christian founders, every single one of them, Jefferson, Franklin, anyone, understood. And they wrote about it, and I quote them in the book. They said, you cannot have self-government, you cannot have the kind of liberty we're talking about where people govern themselves unless the people have virtue. In other words, why would you do the right thing if somebody's not forcing you at the point of a gun or with a sword? Why would you do the right thing? Why would you govern yourself? Because you have virtue. You say, well, I don't steal because I believe stealing is wrong. I don't do this, I don't do that, I pay my taxes. I buy. Why? Because somebody's forcing you? No, 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 we're free. We do it on our own just because we believe it's the right thing. That's virtue. The founders knew and wrote and said over and over and over, if you have a virtuous populace, maybe not everybody, but if you have a citizenry that has a culture of virtue, they could do the thing that's never been done in the history of the world, govern themselves, be free, live under liberty, never been done. The founders said, freedom requires virtue, requires. But then they said virtue requires faith. Why would you be virtuous? Why would you do the right thing when nobody's forcing you to, when nobody's looking? Because you believe in a higher power. You say, I, I, I don't steal because I, I fear God, because I, I, I want to please God. And so if you have no faith, why would you do the right thing? So the founders understood that where revival breaks out, where people get loony about Jesus, crime tends to go down. Domestic abuse tends to go down. Corruption tends to go down. So even if the founders, like let's say Benjamin Franklin or Jefferson, didn't quite have the kind of faith that I do, well, nonetheless, they saw that when people get that kind of faith, self-government goes up. Liberty goes up because virtue increases. They saw, because in the, in the, in the 18th century, George Whitfield was preaching up and down the 13 colonies, revival was breaking out, that where revival breaks out and people get loony about Jesus, suddenly they have the ability to govern themselves. The founders understood that it's possible. Never been done in the history of the world. So when people tell you that, I, I don't know about American exceptionalism, folks, this had never been done. The reason it had never been done is because human beings are broken sinners. And unless you get Jesus in your life, or unless you get God in your life, or unless you're hanging out in a community where that's how people think, you need somebody to point a gun at you to tell you to do the right thing. You need to be threatened to do the right thing. And most of history is a history of that. Until 1776, when the founders said, we think it is possible. So we're going to have some checks and balances, because we understand we don't want mob rule. We don't want somebody getting in control. We want the people to govern themselves. But we understand that freedom requires virtue. 
Virtue requires faith. Here's where it gets funny. You say, well, we figured it out. Virtue requires faith. So let's force everybody to go to church, you know, to have a 20-minute quiet time. We'll just force people to do those things, right? Well, I think you understand you can't do that. Faith that is real, that is not mandated by the state. If it's mandated by the state, you might as well be living in North Korea or in Saudi Arabia. Real faith, faith in the God of the Bible, has to be free, has to bubble up freely. So the founders understood that we have to have a separation of church and state. We have to have a system where the government has no say in what you believe, whether you believe, where you worship, how you worship. That is none of the government's business. And they enshrined it in our First Amendment. It is called religious liberty, and it is at the heart of all of our liberties. And they said if we have religious liberty, we believe people will choose to worship the one true God in their own way. And if they don't, we can't force them. But a culture was created where people in America had freedom of religion. Not freedom of worship where you go in that building and do what you want, but when you come out, you bow to the secular authority of the state. No. True freedom of religion. You could live your faith out in every sphere. So the founders understood this concept that... Without faith, without virtue, without freedom of religion to give people the ability to have faith and virtue, the whole thing doesn't work. And that concept has been passed on through the generations until about now, until recently. We've seen God pulled out. We've seen the secularization of the culture. We've seen many churches bow to secular forces and say, well, we want to be political. We'll go along with whatever. The moment you go along with whatever, you have ceased to be the church of Jesus Christ. And I say that if you're going to a church that is not vocal on the issue, on all of these issues that are issues of morality, you need to get out of that church. Now, why do I say that? I say that because I wrote this, the longest book I ever wrote was about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The shortest book I ever wrote is the new book, Letter to the American Church. Because I saw that what happened in Germany in the 1930s with the rise of the Nazis and the silence of the church at that time, that is what is happening in America now. In other words, the German church at the time, and I'm talking about a lot of good people. These aren't all wicked people. A lot of good people, a lot of good pastors had a religious view in the negative sense of the church and their faith. We're just going to stay in our religious corner. We don't want to get political. We don't want to get controversial. Again, where would you get the idea that believing in the God of the Bible, that you're not going to sometimes maybe be controversial because, you know, there are forces of wickedness that hate you and hate your God. And if you think that you can just smile at them and that they're going to somehow come to faith, there comes a time you have to fight for what is right. And it happened in this country with the slavery issue. That's the obvious one, right? But there were pastors saying, well, that's not a gospel issue. We just want to stick to our little religious stuff. If enslaving another human being is okay with your faith, you do not have a real Christian faith. Now, I hope that I will meet every one of these confused sinners in heaven, but I'm telling you, if you think your faith doesn't touch on political issues, you are fundamentally mistaken. That is a non-biblical view. Have you read the book of Esther? I think that's in the Bible. I think that's in the Old Testament. What is, is, you know, Mordecai says, I will not bow to Haman. I will not do what the government tells me. That's in the Bible. Okay, the Bible doesn't say, do whatever the government tells you. But people say, well, Romans 13, Romans 13. The Bible contains more chapters than Romans 13. Did you know that? So people can use the word of God for satanic purposes. Satan quoted scripture in the wilderness. Be careful. We're called to be wise as serpents. Many Christians think we're supposed to be wise as doves. That's not scriptural. We're supposed to understand that there are evil forces that want to shut you up, want to shut the voice of the church down, 
to do harm to our fellow human beings, folks. Forget about the church. It's not about us. Bonhoeffer saw that the Nazis were harming the Jews. He was not a Jew. His family weren't Jews. But he said, God calls me to speak out for those who are being abused, who are being marginalized, who are being demonized. Jesus died on the cross so that I would be free to speak the truth. And he spoke the truth. But what happened, what happened in Germany at that time, and this is the point, the church didn't understand its role. It didn't understand its role. It said, we're just going to stay here in our little religious corner. We're just going to preach the gospel. We're just going to do church on Sunday. That's not the church, folks. The church is God's army of people who say, I will die for the truth. I will die for my fellow man. I will, I will fight. I will lose friends. I believe corruption is evil. I, I believe harming other human beings is evil. I believe sex trafficking of children on the southern border is from the pit of hell. And, and, and if that makes me political, I, I don't care about being political. I care about those human beings that God loves. So Bonhoeffer was trying to call the church in Germany and say, hey, church, now is your chance to stand against the Nazis. The Nazis are atheistic. They're going to talk a good game. Liars, I don't know if you knew this, liars don't always tell the truth. <laughs> Did you know that? So Hitler and the Nazis were not about to say, like, we're serving Satan or we don't believe in the God of the Bible. They talked a good game, okay? You get, you get a lot of politicians today, they'll talk a good game. Watch what they do and you'll see that it contradicts 1,000% what they're saying, right? So Hitler was not stupid. He was wise as a serpent and he talked a good God game. But Bonhoeffer and a handful of others said, what the Nazis are bringing is evil. And if we in the church of Jesus Christ do not speak out against the Nazis and use all of our cultural power to fight against them, God will judge us for doing nothing. God will judge us for our silence. And I want to tell you, many good pastors did not listen to that. Many good pastors got it wrong. Just as many good pastors and good church leaders and good Christians in America are getting this wrong now. And the story of Bonhoeffer, which is why I wrote a letter to the American church, tells you what happens when the church is silent in the face of evil. What happens when Christians are so religious in the negative sense, they say, we're just going to stick in our religious lane. We're just going to talk about Jesus and the Bible, and we don't want to get involved in that other stuff. I'm here to tell you once again, that is not biblical. That is a bastardization of scriptural clear scriptural thinking. It is a twisting. And if you have a biblical view, you say, God has called me to take my faith into every sphere. And you know what happens when Christians take their faith into every sphere? Slavery gets abolished. You think that was a good thing? I do. I think that was a work of God. And I know that the abolitionist movement, because I wrote a book about William Wilberforce called Amazing Grace, the abolitionist movement was led by born again Jesus freaks. It was not led by the pious churchgoers. The same pious churchgoers that had no problem with chattel slavery in America had no problem with the Jews disappearing in Germany. They said, well, that's not my business. God says it's your business. And if God says it's your business, you better make it your business. Otherwise, you're disobeying God. And you say, well, I have faith. I'm a Christian. Well, God says you don't. God says faith without works is dead. So you're not saved by your works. We know that. But the point is, if you have real faith, if you understand Jesus really was God, really died for me, really rose from the dead, really ascended into heaven and sent his Holy Spirit down to empower me to be his church in my time. If you understand that, you're going to live differently. But there are many people in the American church, just like in the German church at that time, they didn't get that memo. They think that I can live just like the world. I just have to believe. Well, if you think you believe and there's no works that follow, if you're not willing to risk it, if you're not willing to lay it on the line, God says in the book of James that you, you, you don't have faith. Now, that's a chilling, that ought to be a chilling thing to the church of Jesus Christ. That maybe if you think you have faith, God says, well, I don't think you have faith. 
We have to live out our faith. And so Bonhoeffer tried to get the church to wake up. And we know now that the church said, not yet, not yet. We don't want to fight. We don't want to be political. Not yet. And once they understood what was happening, it was too late. And that is the point of the forces of wickedness. They want to talk a good game and keep the church quiet and tame and stupid for just as long as it takes. I think of the image of Gulliver being tied down by the Lilliputians. You think of that image, right? The Lilliputians are tiny, and he's sleeping, and they're tying him down with threads. Now, if he wakes up at any point, it's game over for the Lilliputians. But if they can keep him sleeping a little longer, if the devil can keep the church sleeping a little bit longer, just a little bit longer, don't worry, don't wake up. The pendulum swings back and forth. Don't get involved. That's what Satan did in Germany. And when they woke up, there was nothing they could do. It was over. They had missed it. They were tied down by the Lilliputians. They were unable to get up because they had been sleeping and sleeping and sleeping. And the devil did his work. And the laws are put in place. And people are canceled and marginalized and pretty much pretty soon there's nobody to speak for you it's over that happened in Germany it's true it's not a, an idea it happened and so when I saw it happening in America I said I need to talk about this I need to tell the American church you're doing exactly the same thing that the German church did that good people did you don't have to be pro-nazi to go along with what the Nazis are doing. You just have to do nothing. And you know what? As, as I tell you, the devil is fine with you doing nothing. You know, you don't have to be woke and, and pro everything evil. Just keep your mouth shut and don't do anything. That's, that'll work just fine. And a lot of Christians have this religious view, this, neg this, this wrong view that I can be in the middle. I can be on the fence. I don't have to choose. I don't want to be divisive. If you are on the fence, ladies and gentlemen, the devil owns that fence. And he'd be thrilled for you to stay right there until he's got it all wrapped up. So if you think about it, the founders said, we cannot have America in the real sense without virtue, without faith. And we have seen in our time, the forces of secularism infiltrate the church to the point of, again, in many, many cases, just silencing the church, just saying like, just stay in your lane. Don't talk about those things. Don't talk about vaccines or don't talk about uh, government mandates or, or corruption or don't talk about, about the border or don't talk about this. If you do, you'll get canceled. People call you names. So just shut up and preach your little gospel. And a lot of people in our time, just like in Germany, they've gone along with that because they got some kind of a memo that we're supposed to be winsome all the time. You know, if somebody's trying to rape you and kill your family, that's really not the time for winsomeness. That's the same time to go to war. And when I say go to war, you know, I don't mean getting a musket. I, I, I'm saying that you understand, I have to fight for what is right. You think it was easy fighting against the slave trade? Do You think it was easy in the civil rights movement, which came out of the churches? You've seen the, the, the images of, of, of how human beings treated other human beings during that. So you think it was easy? But when you know you're doing what God called you to do, you don't care if it's easy, right? You think about the Montgomery bus boycott. Think of this. People walked to work for a year before they would comply with that evil bus company. They didn't say, well, listen, whatever. I'm, I'm taking the bus. No, no, no. They understood this is a moral issue. It's a moral issue where you shop in a store like Target that is trying to groom your children and is going along with the satanic agenda. That's a moral issue. And you say, well, I don't want to drive. I got to drive out of the way. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, humble black Americans were willing to walk to work for a year and more for a, an issue of dignity and justice. Are we so lazy and spoiled that we are not willing to sacrifice to save our nation from the lip of the abyss, which most of us, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you know 
that, that tremendous wicked forces are working to rob us of our liberty, to rob us of, of our voice. And again, if you rob the church of its voice, forget about the church, folks. It's not about us. It's about all those people who are trying to raise their kids in this country. They don't know what to think. If they don't see the church speaking up, imagine if the Jews in Germany had seen the church of Jesus Christ stand up for them. You want to talk about evangelism? What does it mean if people risk their lives and their voice and their jobs for you? It means everything. So when we speak against the transgender madness, when we speak against critical race theory, we speak against these things, do you know how many people that are not part of your church are going to go, you know what? I don't know what I thought of that place, but those people actually seem to believe in what seems right. Things are going crazy, and I thought I was going crazy. But I see the Church of Jesus Christ speaking the truth as though they actually believe it, and, and as if they don't care what happens to them for speaking the truth. That looks like real courage to me. So it's why I wrote the book Letter to the American Church, because I said there's a lot of good people on the fence. They need to understand, folks, the time is short. We're at the 11th hour. If, 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 if you are a Christian or you are part of some church that is not part of this battle on all of these fronts, because people say, well, we don't want to be political, I beg you to get out of that church. I beg you to find a church. I don't care how far you have to drive. I don't care if you have to do it online. But the point is, if, if you are part of that kind of a church, I want to tell you, there were Germans in those churches in the 30s in, in Germany, and they just went along with it. And every day, every Sunday, they would go to that church and they would ignore the satanic evil that was being perpetrated, not just to the Jews, but to all kinds of people, this evil, this atheistic evil. And they ignored it. They said, well, we're just going to go to church. Folks, that's not a church anymore. You heard about when Jesus cursed the fig tree. If you're not bearing fruit, Jesus will curse you and move on. And there are churches that are withering and dying now because they refuse to speak the truth. They're afraid to speak the truth. And if you're afraid to speak the truth, I just want to know who are you afraid of and why are you afraid? Do you not believe that Jesus defeated death on the cross? If you believe he defeated death on the cross and rose from the dead, if you believe that, then you are going to be able to say, fear not, be of good courage. You're going to be able to live that way. God has called us to live that way. Abraham Kuyper, the famous Dutch theologian, said, there's not one square inch in all creation over which Jesus Christ, who is sovereign, does not say, mine. The Lord wants us to open our hearts to him and to live for him and to be a force for goodness in a dark time. There are people outside this room people all over this country hungry for truth, hungry for people willing to put their faith, if it's real, on the line, to fight for what is right and true, just as people fought against the slave trade, just as people for over 50 years marched against abortion. And you know, when people say, you know what, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. It's lost. It's over. That is the voice of the devil. Because do you know how many people said, the last chapter in my book is about Ronald Reagan, saying in 1987, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, okay? The members of what we now call the deep state, okay, the moderates, they all said, oh, Mr. President, you can't say that. You know, we've made peace with the Soviet Union. We've got detente. In other words, we don't care if there are people rotting in the gulag. We don't care. We just want to keep the status quo. And Reagan said, I'm going to say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall because I actually want to defeat satanic, atheist, Soviet communism, which is oppressing millions and millions and millions of people. But there are people then who said, it'll never happen. You'll never succeed. Well, you know and I know, by the grace of God, the Iron Curtain came down, the Soviet Union was disbanded, East Germany, where my mother grew up, became part of Germany, and those people are now free because they're people like Ronald Reagan who actually believe defeating evil is part of God's values in this world. And how many people do you know, and maybe some of you are in this room, who said, listen, 
doesn't matter how you vote. Roe v. Wade will never, ever, ever be changed. Get used to it. I don't know about you, but I, I read someplace that it was overturned. But do you know how many Christians said, I'm not going to vote for that guy because, by the way, that will never be overturned and just don't bother. Everybody who listened to those voices made it possible for Roe v. Wade never to be overturned. But those people who voted, who said, you know what, it's a binary choice. I, I don't love that candidate, but I, I, I kind of think some of these things are important. I, I better do what I can and pray. Because of that, the unthinkable thing, Roe v. Wade, by the grace of the Lord Jesus, was overturned in America. So don't let anybody tell you that your faith is supposed to stay out of politics. You're supposed to take your faith into every part of the world to bless others. When slavery was abolished in America, how many people were blessed by the church being activated and getting political against the slave trade and against slavery? How many people were blessed because of the civil rights movement? How many human beings will breathe and live and have a life because Roe v. Wade was overturned? Folks, you know you're not supposed to make an idol of politics. But if you don't live out your faith in every sphere, and not everybody's called to politics, but I'm telling you folks, if you're an American, you've been deputized by God to govern yourself and to be involved as a citizen. That is a privilege. People have died for that privilege. People have bled and died so that you could be free. You need to use your freedom for God's purposes. And you need to know it's exactly what Carrie Lake said. It's it. You are not, it's not a mistake that you're alive now. God called you into being to be alive now for his purposes in history. So the Lord is speaking to his people and saying, I need you to be activated. I need you to put your faith into action for my purposes in history. If you do that, you have no idea what can happen, and anybody tells you it can't happen, that's the voice of the devil, don't listen to them. Be of good courage, be encouraged, march forward under his banner and to his glory. It is why we are here. God bless you. God bless you.